Well, in that review that I did, it was awesome training for me because I saw everybody shoot all their traces, all their impacts, and a light bulb went off. I'm like, holy cow. I called Derek. I'm like, dude, we got to go to the 416. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, imp, the 416 round is twice the energy of a 375 shy tech at, at two miles. Paul Phillips, how you doing, man? Good. So I've known you for a long time because F class, but uh, lately you've transitioned more towards EOLR, correct? Yeah, I, um, after the Worlds, after we won the World Championship in 17, um, you know, after winning three World Championships with the U.S. Rifle Team, I was kind of getting, you know, I want something different. And uh, at that time, in 2015 was the first year they had King of Two Mile. And I kind of caught some interest in that. And I uh, thought, wow, that sounds pretty cool. And I think it was, you know, Brian Litz and Mitch Fitzpatrick were building the rifle to compete in 2016. And they wanted me to come, you know, tag along. We were all in the US F class team at the time. And uh, they wanted me to tag along and be a spotter and help out with wind and coaching type thing. So I went out there and I just had a ball. It was just a lot of fun. Uh -huh. You know, starting out starting out at a mile and then working out to two miles was a huge challenge. And uh, we had a lot of fun. We ended up winning winning the event, like first, second, and fourth, I think we took. But, you know, there wasn't that many shooters back then, maybe only 20 or 30 shooters, but now we're up to 100 at King of Two Mile. And we're in, like, yeah. I was just thinking about that today. You know, we're in, let's see, USA, Canada, France, Ukraine, Russia, Italy, Spain, South America, South Africa, and there's a few other countries that want to have them. So it's really growing big, and uh, you know it's pretty neat. Um, the whole, the whole, the rules and organization. There's talks about a lot of different things going on. I'm actually gonna, and I actually, when uh, Pete Brownell was the president of the NRA. Uh, we had a little chat because he, you know, he's been sponsoring me for a long time with Team Sinclair, with the FTR <clears throat> and Brownells, and um, he had wanted me to write the curriculum for the uh, NRA ELR National Championship. So I did that. So I've been running that for three, four years, and I think last uh, in 2019 we had 60 or 70 shooters. So it's getting bigger. And then this year, obviously with the pandemic, we didn't have it. But next year I'm going to be having another event. And actually, Eric, it's funny, we talked at Nationals this year about it, but I think I'm going to schedule it and run it just like you guys have the V2. And the reason why it's so important to do that that way, I think it's a brilliant concept that you guys came up with. In ELR, it's even more important because when you're going mano a mano against another guy, it doesn't matter when you get seated. So in a normal event now, you could just have a morning session and there's no wind. Well, if you're shooting two miles and no wind, it's a huge advantage, even more than F-class, versus a guy shooting 25 mile an hour wind at two miles. I mean, you literally, you're taken out of it because the time frame and the squatting, or the seating effort. <clears throat> so in the V2 method, like a Final Four tournament, it's just, you just have to beat the guy next to you whenever you get called. So I don't care when, what, what time or when, how much the wind's blowing, if it's 10 mile an hour, if it's nothing, if it's 20, you have to beat that guy in that wind condition. So for ELR, I really think it's gonna be groundbreaking because once I think people see this, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be more of a fair match. Because I'll admit, I won in 19 or 18, I won the national championship in 2018, the NRA. And uh, I was the first person to shoot. I drew a number and it was number one and I just, I got lucky. It was no wind conditions, and it helped me, right? Um, so this new format, I think it's going to be a lot more fair for everybody. Um, and I think it's going to be more exciting, too. Well, that's why we did it. As you know, you, I mean, you, you shot F-Class for a long time, and look at the, the luck of the relay, right? If you get oh. a good relay, you know. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's... it's uh, it's always more challenging when you have to shoot against somebody, and I think it's more... Uh, more exciting too, like you said, you know, because there's the, the people can spectate and and you know you're you know 
some guys are going or some shooters are going for this one some are going for that one and it's it's it creates excitement right it right. makes it it makes it a spectator event whenever you have two shooters sure. going at it i think another thing that you know me and pete Burnell talked about with this elr stuff was we also we, we didn't want to have a situation where a group of people would just clean everybody's clocks every year year to year to year <clears> and all the prizes and all the money would just keep going to the same people we didn't want to have that that way so we came up with um with the one mile club match or what was the original one was a one mile club match but basically if anybody came and they were successful hitting the one mile target we would get a, give them a certificate awarding them for a personal best um, type of thing so people would come back um and then go for those one mile 1.5 mile two mile clubs you know so there's these club things i think it's great because you know somebody may not have the sponsorships or the dedication or even willing to want to go shoot all the time maybe they just want to go one time just to try to shoot that one mile plate and then get their certificate and then they have their bragging rights uh you know back home with all their buddies in hunting camp <laughs> i mean my dad he's got a certificate <laughs> and the whole neighborhood it's a talking piece when they see the one mile you know shot uh, in right, a competition right. and it's different you know when you talk about back home in the back 40 you know, where it's your home range and you're, every day you're shooting, you know, the wind, the distance. It's a different situation when you go to a range where it's an unknown distance and you have to hit it within five shots. It's a totally different situation. And the wind is always different and uh, whatnot. So, you know, ELR is, is you know, people talk about ELR and, and, pe and, the, and people are getting really good at it. But to go to a raw range, like I flew to France in uh, 19 and I competed in the King of Two Mile of France never been there in my life. I had no clue what to expect. Uh, the elevations, the temperatures, the winds, I had no clue. It was just a raw range. To go place in the top three and stuff like that, it's very difficult versus maybe like Spear Point. A lot of guys in Kansas shoot at Spear Point. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not, but it's really up and coming and growing, very popular. They run a great match out there. But a lot of the people that go there, it's the same targets, the same distances, the same direction of fire same temperatures every single month or every, you know, so they're getting, so it's the point now where they don't even have to have a Kestrel. They already have all their notes. So it's kind of like shooting F open, right? You go to a thousand yard range, you know, you're zero. You kind of have a good idea for a starting wind. So you get used to those types of things. I mean, now, you know, we've been shooting F class for so long that you go any range in the country and you, you already know pretty much what the wind is worth within a minute. I mean, you're pretty good, you know, right. Um, so we don't want that in ELR. We want it to have it be always using your science and technology, um, you know, to come up with your zeros and come up with the wind prediction and force you to learn that, not just, hey, what's my come up? Or, hey, what do you have for wind? You know, we want to have it to be raw. And one more, you know, kind of like PRS stuff, we, you know, we have conversations. And one more element that I'd like to add to the V2 or whatever we call it, national championships next year would be not only have it be v2 or or final four tournament style but but then one more caveat have it be in isolation and what i mean by that is having two tents having the pre-stage guys in one tent you know take all their communication devices radios phones what have you have the two-man team come up to the firing point they have to take get all their data themselves and communicate to themselves when they're completed they go down to the the post tent or the after the match tent. So they so don't they talk to each other. Yeah. They can't tell, hey, I had five minutes of wind and <clears throat> my elevation was such and such because we're shooting the same bolt, the same speed. Force people to learn how to range find and use a solver and use all the tools that we have. Because typically right now, it may be only one person on the team that does that or two people and they're just sharing information. So it becomes a, a huge, if you have a 10 man squad, it really all you're doing is you're just passing information down and then they are in, they don't have to work for it. so i'd like to be able to maybe have something in place to where it's a true measurement of your ability to do everything right range find um call the wind spot you know and then and all the fundamentals of shooting and loading as well so it has every element there right yeah no that sounds like a more fair fight for everybody <laughs> now yeah. Now we, we jump right into ELR, but but let's talk about your background, right? Because you shot 
F class for a very long time. How long did you shoot right. F class? Um, let's see. So in uh, let's see, 2004, it was the first national championships. It was at Camp Buckner, I think, 2004. That was a Team Sinclair. Actually, no, that was um, Great Lakes Express that turned into Team Sinclair, but it's the same people. Me, Brad Solvey, Ray Gross, and John Drolli started in 2004. And we racked up, what, 11 national championships, and we still hold the current national record still today. Yeah, for team. For four-man, 1,000-yard, yeah. Yeah. The 792 with 38. But we picked up Derek Rogers around 2013-14. We picked up Jeff Rogers, Dan Polable. So that whole group we've been shooting for a long time. I think we're the only team where every single member on the team has been on a world championship and won a gold medal for Team USA. A lot of experience. We've helped each other over the years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what? So 2004 to 2021? been quite a few years and then before that in the 90s i started shooting palma at the uh camp perry with you know ray gross and john droy they kind of took me under their wing and taught me how to reload and got my bug you know into the thousand yard matches and stuff and <clears throat> so what 1995 i think i started and did, you know the long range and that's where i met you know dave tubb and tompkins and nancy and, and uh you know the whole crew down there they're they're legends really i mean they've They've been shooting the company. That's all there was back then. There was no PRS. There was no ELR. There was no, you know, these hybrid matches, uh, the uh, Night Force ELR matches, stuff like that. So we really kind of, and it was kind of funny, Eric. Um, did you shoot the 2004 Nationals? No, I wasn't. No. I wasn't or, I'm sorry. The, okay. I wasn't well, it was kind of funny because the, the first <laughs> year that we shot, I mean, it was a massive prize table. Free scopes, rifles. <clears throat> Docs. I mean, it was just a massive thing. Well, back in the day at NRA match, you know, you shoot for a whole week and finish really well and maybe win a few matches and you get these little tiny medals, right? <laughs> no prizes. You paid for all your bullets, primers, powder. You paid for everything. There was no sponsorships back then. Um, it might, you might, somebody might throw you a t shirt at me, you know, that was right. it. So we've came a long way as far as the business end of it, um, you know, sponsorships, social media. Things like you're doing right now, it's promoting the sport, promoting products, promoting, you know, events. So we've came a long ways for sure. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I started my company. When I was an adjutant for the U.S. Rifle Team in the last session, I became friends with all these sponsors that sponsored the U.S. team. And that kind of bled into them wanting me to help them with their company, with advertising, being, a, being an advocate for their company and their, pro and their products. And then that's how, you know, GPG was sprung. Global Precision Group, you know, because I wanted to, when I retire in two months, I wanted to have something to where I can still do what I love to do and work with people like yourself and other manufacturers and military and law enforcement and hunters to kind of stay doing what I love to do. And that's kind of best of both worlds, right? Absolutely, man. I mean, if you can, if you can make a living doing this, doing the, the thing that you're obviously passionate about, I mean, there's, there's no question that you're passionate about what, what you do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's great. Um, so, you know, you shoot Palma, you shoot TR. Did you ever shoot open? Never shot F open. No. Never shot F open. You just, just I mean, you no. shot TR for a long time. And heck, I just saw you at the Nationals. You're still kind of dipping your toes or I don't know. Yeah, it's no, not considered I, I was, dipping your toes anymore. But No, I was still, really happy. You know, we got Team Creedmoor came on to sponsor the, the old crew. And, and I finished fifth overall. And, and we took... We tied the U.S. team for, in the team match. We they out X'd us. So, being off for three years and just getting the whole crew together, I think we did pretty darn good. Oh, you know? absolutely. I mean, well, it's like riding a bicycle, right? <laughs> I know, but still, though, Eric, you know how it is. If you're oh. not practicing, you know, I, I mean, I, that was a joke. But yes, it's 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 extreme. Even when you are practicing, it's extremely mm -hmm. hard to be consistently at the top. Because right. everybody else is practicing and everybody else is right. getting really good and everybody yeah. else. So, yeah, to be off for three years and come back yeah. and, and, yeah, you guys did outstanding. You know, and a lot of people ask me, you know, that, well, you get a trainer rifle, like a 22 or a different discipline. You know, I actually, in my opinion, I disagree with that. If you want to be good at ELR, you have to shoot an ELR rifle. And preferably the one that you're going to be shooting in competition. If you want to be good at F open, you need to get an F open rifle and go shoot F open matches. Um, because they're different animals, you know, 
there's some similarities with marksmanship, but still, there's so many little intricate things, as you well know, Eric, that, you know, you, you dabbled with PRS stuff, and you, you know, so you know what I'm saying. It's just a different animal when you get on the oh, yeah. F-Open gun. There's different skill set. Absolutely. So, I was interviewing uh, Todd Hendricks, who is just the uh, recent national champion for F-Open. Yeah. Right. And one thing he did talk about is uh, a big setback for him was using a 6.5 by 47 Lapua at 600. He, yeah. he instead of using his, his main rifle, he, he built a, a, a trainer and he said it felt like that set him back because it, it yeah. was it was too easy to load for. It was yep. too easy yep. to shoot. It, everything was too easy. And yep. then when he went back to his big rifle, you know, well, <clears> call <throat> it, you know, his 284. He right. said it was different. It was different enough that he got pretty much no help at all, and and he even thinks that he sure. he was set back by the by the six five by forty seven. Sure. So his thing was shoot exactly what you just said. Shoot that one rifle that you're going to shoot. That's the one you shoot, and that's it. Yep. And even more than that, training. So in ELR, it's hard to get ranges that are one to two miles in the Midwest, or really anywhere in the country. And it's a lot of money to travel and to practice. And, um, you know, I go back to 2019. I told my guys, you know, we're going to shoot a lot of practices and a lot of rounds from one to two miles. We're going to do sim simulated matches just like you would do in the King of Two Mile. We're going to have the same time frames. You know, we're going to have, you know, the same setup for the competition. We're just going to do that over and over and over with the same gun, same distances same language so that we developed a skill set within that competition you know a lot of guys will go and you well know this eric like back going back to the u.s rifle team days we had guys that were shooting at the their local ranges doing blow development for two years they never shot matches you'd have the guys that went and shot matches around the country and were finishing the top five well guess who was doing the best in the trials right right the guys that were shooting the matches because they're in a match condition, all the mental pressure, reading the wind, all those other skill sets that you need to win a match, you're practicing those things. You know, shooting groups all the time, that's not going to get you. No, you, know, you have a good shooting rifle, but what wins a match? Is it wind reading ability? Is it management of the match and time frame? Or is it just purely, you know, precision? Well, it's, it, well, you know this, but it's, it's, it's a combination of everything. Right, right. You, you have you have to have a good shooting rifle, but you yep. also have to have uh, the wind reading abilities and mm. the mental capacity to handle the pressure. And right. you don't have you can get a good shooting rifle, shooting groups on your own, but you're not going to develop the wind reading or the mental capacity, the mental the the mental strength that you need to win a championship. People, right. uh, as you know, I teach classes and I I teach people just like you do, and I tell them I said I can teach anybody just about anybody how to shoot really good in about a year or less right i said but to teach somebody how to win that takes a long time sure winning you know we, we when i was different things yeah you know one of the then that was kind of a rhetorical question when i said that but one of the drills that we did back in the day because a lot of people were spending a lot of time with different barrels and different scopes and you know they're trying to get that small really small group right and i said we're gonna do a little test a 50, a 50 shot test so we had everybody at 500 yards we shot 10 round strings for 50 shots i took all the targets and i told the guys i said i'm not going to measure for score we're just going to be measuring for elevation for 50 shots at 500 yards when i was all done i took them home all the targets and did the whole team like that at the end of the day i did you know we had a little meeting and i, and I showed them the results the best guy was like 0.47, and the worst guy was like 0.71 or 0.72. The moral of the story is everybody had the capable rifle keeping it in the 10 ring for all 20 shots in a string. So I said, you know, let's just forget about doing load development now. You guys all know that you have capable rifles, and they're all very close together. I said, now we need to work on communication, wind reading, cadence, all those things that get you in trouble. You know, cross firing, uh, you know, all those things. So. You know, we went and won a gold medal. So, I mean, moral story is, you know, go shoot matches and learn how to win. That's kind of what. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are crippled by their first match because 
okay, let me rephrase that. They don't want to shoot a match until they're ready. And I say, you're never going to be ready. Right. They want to read. They want to talk to people. They want to go watch. I said, you are never going to be ready. You just right. need to get, get in there, shoot. You're yeah. going to get your ass kicked. Fine. It ain't going to matter. Yeah. Just go and, and shoot. You know, you, yeah, there's no like substitute it's, for that. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, throw yourself to the walls and get beat up and learn, you know, what not to do, right? I mean, that's right. the mastering your craft is learning what not to do. And, you know, I always tell people, I'm sure you do too, but, you know, keep a notebook and write the things that you discover that you need to repeat. Because a lot of times you see the same people making the same mistakes, you know, and making those mental notes or writing down notes. A matter of fact, when I was on, again, going back to the 17 cycle, I reached out to some Olympic coaches, the shooting team in Colorado, and they gave me some great advice because I was looking for advice to what to tell the team. And they said, you know, one of the biggest things that they saw to help people out was for the Olympic athletes that have won gold medals for the U.S. Olympic team for shooting, the difference between them and the guys that maybe just made the team but didn't win a medal was that those guys were actually going and training for a purpose, trying to figure out what's causing their failures, trying to figure out how to be better and coming up with a plan and goals and going out and trying one thing at a time and see if it works. You know, those guys really stuck to their notebooks and their notes and they had a, they had a plan and goal. Um, what, you know, so I kind of tried to model that for us as the team to try to try different things and experiment and to try to come up with a measuring system of how to get better, right? And being honest with yourself and not trying to fib. You know, we've all done that before. We went up to the range and maybe only kept the good groups, right? We just <laughs> oh, forget yeah. about the bad groups, right? But those are the things that you need to learn. Why you shot the bag or what, why do you pull that rounder? You know, so I think for all the shooters out there, no matter what discipline, you know, to be honest with yourselves, you know, go videotape yourselves, watch yourself, come up, make sure you make good notes. And next time you go to the range, try something different. And that's the way you learn, you know, and how you can be honest with yourself and learn. Uh, the other big mistake people make is uh, they always want to shoot when it's calm. Mm -hmm. They go out early in the morning or late in the evening and they shoot right. and, and when it's windy, they don't, they don't want, they don't even want to get out of bed. Right. That's when you learn, right? right. They, that's sure. when you're going to learn because guess what? Yeah. When you're in competition, you're going to have to shoot through it all. Right. And if I've always said the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So right. when it gets windy, the wind eliminates at least 60, 70% of the competition. Sure. That means you're, now, now you just have a lot less people to, to beat because you know what it's like. Mm -hmm. You have somebody that maybe doesn't have a whole lot of experience, but has a really good shooting rifle. They're right. going to rack up a lot of points when it's calm. Sure. But you, you need that wind to really weed them out. Right. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's another mistake people make. Get out there. When it's windy, get out there and shoot, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I remember back, geez, in the 90s, I used to watch, you know, Nancy and Mid used to put the clinics on for people to help them out, people starting out for shooting. And, you know, I remember they used to bracket, you know, they'd, they'd be in a practice session, they'd wait till big gusts come. And then you'd guess to kind of see what it was worth and you'd shoot at zero just to see how much it was worth. And you'd write down what you saw and, you know, old school stuff. Right. right so, right. you know, that we still use that in ELR today. We bracket, you know, when you get a strongest gust and you, you made it, maybe make a note. Now, a lot of times ELR, we don't have wind flags like in F class. It might be just a raw range. So you have to start looking at natural terrain, natural vegetation, <clears> that <throat> one tree limb, it's bending over, you know, at a certain angle and you write that or whatever you pick out for an obstacle out there for train association, you write that down. Maybe the vehicle drives through the area and you see the dust cloud just zooming across, or maybe it's just coming up slow, you know, referencing all those points and coming out with a system to where you can kind of bracket that stuff. And then when and during the match, you have your brackets. So now you're somewhere in between there. So now you can make a more educated guess going off of your, you know, ballistic solver and all your information at hand there too. So, it all comes together, you know, those basic fundamentals, you know, they do cross over to each sport. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. Uh, you know, the no flags, right? Because, uh, and, you know, even in F-class, right? Even in F-class, they're different 
you can see mirage but there's different mirage currents running sure. even at a thousand yards i can only right. imagine what it's like when you guys have to shoot two miles right you know I'm yeah it's nuts it. i mean and the thing is you can't a lot of times you can't see anything right um you might be able to see the first thousand yards you might be able to see a little mirage but then once you get up the next valley there's nothing and then there's no trace you're shooting up in the sky so right. you lose the trace; it just disappears uh, it's difficult, you know, and sometimes, you know, what it comes down to is you make you make your best guess. And then if you see a splash at two miles and just rapid fire, <laughs> <laughs> just you know, just rapid it. fire and just try to hopefully get lucky and hit it. I mean, really, you know, I mean, sometimes it comes down to that, right? Just trying to beat the wind and sneak one in there. Yeah. So, so you start shooting uh, EOLR after the. 2017 world championship the f-class world championship um no well, i actually started i we won the king of two mile in 16. okay me and mitch and brian <clears throat> together as a team so it was maybe and around then, when did you start 2015. okay so in 15 when were you king of two miles uh well we i was on the team with First mitch time. we won in 16 okay. and then me and derek won in 17. And that was a TV show. Derek won with me and Amos spotting for him. Okay. And then in 18, I took third. And then in 19, I took first. And then Derek took third. And then my teammate, Mark, took fourth. So we did first, third, and fourth out of 80. Wow. So that was kind of really, it was, it was, uh, that's probably my most memorable moment in shooting was the 2019 King of Two Mile because all three of us finished first, third, and fourth out of 80. Wow. That's, that's tough. Yeah. And so, we, we put a lot of hard work in it, Eric. We traveled to the desert like three or four times. We shot probably a thousand rounds of competition at one to two miles. We really paid our dues for that one. Well, that's what it, well, and see, that's, you and I talked about this before. You guys know how to win. This is back to the, to that comment I made earlier. You know, it takes a while to learn how to shoot, but to learn how to win, it's, it's totally different mindset. And you guys already know how to win, right? You know what it takes. You can't just say, well, I'm a good shooter. I'm going to get a rifle and I'm going to go win. You, you know yeah. you have to put in the work. Um, For sure. And, and you know, in ELR, it's it's just, you know, it's growing leaps and bounds. And there's a lot of hungry shooters out there. They're spending a lot of money. They're shooting a lot of matches. And it's just, it keeps on getting tougher and tougher. Just like F-Class, you know. In the back of the early 2000s, you know, our rifles weren't that good. I mean, we had a, the, the first target was just a long range target. That was a 10 inch X ray. Right, right. You know, so we were cleaning targets back then. Well, you know, the rifles we have today would have probably would have shot a 20 X clean, no problem. Oh, you know? yeah. And, the, and that old, um, well, yeah, that, but that's just same with clean. ELR. You know, we got more technology with, uh, you know, rifle stocks, barrels, scopes, everything, bullets. And it's been kind of fun, Eric, with me, because I've been involved with the manufacturers with all these different items as we go forward and how to build stuff and how to perfect stuff. And I've been kind of the tester. So really, I mean, I kind of come into this at the right time because I'm, you know, doing well, but then I'm also testing and doing a lot of shooting to where I know what works and what doesn't work so well. Right. And I mean, that's a big advantage. So, so what was the first rifle you built? Uh, for the uh, King of Two Mount ULR stuff? Yeah. Well, Mitch Fitzpatrick built me a um, 375 Lethal Mag. So okay. it's a 375 Shy Tech improved, shooting a uh, 400 grain laser. I was testing all the cutting edge bullets at the time, and I had a whole bunch of different bullets, and those just those things were just stupid. They'd shoot like between like six and 12 inch groups at a mile. Wow. I mean, just <clears throat> crazy good. And so yeah, that was that gun, and uh, um, yeah. And then after that one, I did the the 2017 when Derek went with the 375 Shy Tech, and we did the um, King of Two Mile TV show, and it was on um, a Pursuit Channel. We were going to have it on the military channel, but then the Las Vegas incident happened, and they didn't want to push it so oh, we, yeah. we went to pursuit but actually it was a blessing because all the people in Europe watched it over the internet because it's internet TV and then it went made it to a YouTube channel you can still watch it today Google it but I think we got like 5 million views now wow that's sure. cool yeah 
But anyway, so in 17, we used 375s. When I was doing all the editing for the TV show, because I was color commentator, it was amazing, Eric. I was watching all this video that no one else got to see because I saw all the cameras and I watched everybody shoot like 15 times because we had to understand the storyline to be able to interject things and statements and what was going on. Well, in that review that I did, it was awesome training for me because I saw everybody shoot all their traces, all their impacts, and a light bulb went off. I'm like, holy cow. I called Derek. I'm like, dude, we got to go to the 416 <laughs> because the the imp- the 416 round is twice the energy of a 375 shy tech at two miles. So the twice the energy, that, it just, just annihilates rock and debris and dirt. So if you don't see, you can have a quarter minute rifle, but if you don't see the splash, you're going home. You have to be able to see where you hit. Right. And then the response would be, well, just don't miss. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's well, just simple. not the case. I mean, there, there's guys I know that I've watched in practice that have had amazing accurately rifles. Go, go unk at a mile on the first plate and go home. So here you are, you bought this $10,000 rifle. You took a week off work. You've practiced for a whole year. All this ammunition, you know, ten, fifteen dollars a shot. You drive all the way across the country to go to King of Two Mile, and in the qualification round, you miss the first plate five times in a row. You pack your stuff and you go back home. Mm. It's brutal. It's yeah. brutal. You, I mean, so and they have great rifles, but they just didn't see where they were hitting. You know, I think it was Mark Lonsdale in 2018. He hit the frame five times in a row and had a group the size wow. of a tennis ball. <laughs> but they did, couldn't see because it was hitting the frame. There was no splash. Yeah, yeah. You know, at a mile, it's a long way, right? Yeah. So, and if you're not seeing any, or if it goes into like a dark area where there's a lot of vegetation, you just you lose it and there's no poof. So it's interesting. So we went to the 416 and there was several people in the community that said it wasn't viable, that it wouldn't work. And I told Derek, I said, even if it's a three-quarter minute rifle, at least we can see the impacts. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it ended up being an amazing rifle with a bad action. We, I, our philosophy, me and Derek kind of worked together on it. And we thought to ourselves, we'll kind of build it after an F-class rifle. You go with a bat single shot, the bull barrel, match chamber. And, uh, you know, Kelly McMillan did the B stock for us. And... Uh, and then we, you know, worked on the ammunition the best we could, but it was a half minute right out of the box. I mean, I just shot a, a new, you know, a, um, Manners sponsored our team for this year because of the weight restrictions going down to 40 pounds. We were all overweight, and um, you know, unfortunately, we lost Kelly, or he would have been working on a new stock for us for sure. But since he left, you know, they're in a new management over there, but. Um, Tom said, yeah, no problem, Paul. We'll work together and we'll build something. So I built a five-pound stock. Well, the McMillan Beast was nine pounds. So it's four pounds. We're, you know, There's no way you're going to lose that unless you chop right. your barrel off. Anyway, fast forwarding, we just did a new stock. And I was just at the range yesterday, and I shot you know, three groups in a row at 100 yards. It was point, or, yeah, 238. Quarter minute of angle for three shots at 100 yards with a 416 Barrett. It's unheard of. It's unheard of. So. So, yeah, I mean, again, technology improvements. I mean, it's really, it really is amazing. I had, a, I did a radio show with Mike Avery um, back with Mitch Fitzpatrick, and we laid down, and with him, I shot ten shots at a mile, and it was less than twelve inches. Ten shots in a row at a mile. Wow. That was several years ago. The rifles we're doing head now are even better, but I'm just saying, the level. Oh, so fat. So back up to. 1992 when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, w- I had Gail McMillan build me my first hunting slash Camp Perry gun. It was a 300 win mag, uh, repeater, and uh, we went and tried to shoot 2,000 yards with it, or a mile or 2,000 yards with it back in 1992, me and John Drolly. And we would probably hit it maybe once or twice, a six by six target frame, maybe once or twice out of 10 shots. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to now, where you put ten in a row and instead of you know twelve inch plate, so it's really came leaps and bounds in the last thirty years. So you guys are using uh, 
So you, you, you mentioned manor stocks, uh, bad actions. Uh, and I've, I've noticed a lot of other action manufacturers are jumping into the making the big, big stuff. Yeah. Um, how long are those barrels that you guys use? 36, 40? 38 to 40. Okay. And yeah. uh, how big around? They're big, right? Yeah. Well, it's a 50 cal neck down to uh, 416. So right there. Let's see. Wow. Here's a... Uh, Uh, so this is a 300 Norma. Versus a, <laughs> Move it up a little. Wow. That's a 300 Norma. Let's see, probably on me like this. There you it's go. a 300 Norma. That's a 416. Wow, that's impressive. Do you yeah. have a 308 you can compare? Oh, uh, should have. Uh, Come on, you got to have a 308. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there's a... That oh my god, that 308 looks tiny. Yeah, it looks so tiny. Yeah, wow, so, that is you know, it's kind of funny. You know, we're dumping 190 grains to 200 grains of powder, so you know, it's uh, it's just different. When I when I shot the nationals this year, Eric, it was like shooting a 22 rimfire because <laughs> I'm so used to the recoil <laughs> and the push and big rounds and. This yeah, you gotta work good. the bolt like this, right? Like crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now, well, now, what we're, are, now, now we're going, well, we got a bunch of stuff we're working on. We keep working on getting better technology and better components, but um, we're going with churn brass now. So it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. I mean, churn brass, right? They're like 10 bucks a piece. This is like pretty. Wow. So you guys turn the ID and the OD, or how does that work? It's there. There's. I put it on my, on my, uh, uh, concentricity gauge, and they are like, all my rounds are like a thousand, for my bullet run out. But how do they make that brass? When you say turn brass, it looks well, like it's turned the whole thing. Yeah, it's turned. It's all turned. So it, it's know, a not, billet. Not a brass maker, but I mean, it's <clears throat> a lot different process than. The, so it sounds sounds like they. Like they take just a rod, a, a rod, and they just they just machine the whole thing. I mean, out. this these things are. And what's funny is, I mean, I, I again, I'm not a engineer or anything, but I can tell you from as far as a shooter. So the Ruag brass we've been using, and it, it worked really well. We won we first, third, and fourth in 19, so I mean, no complaints. But the problem we had, Eric, was we had a lot of bolt sticky bolt. It would create pressure at like right around 3,000 feet per second. So going from this brass to the RCC, I can load 100 feet per second faster with no bolt lift wow. with this brass. Same bullet, same powder, same primer, just changing the brass. We're getting 100 feet per second more with no bolt with the same bolt lift pressure signs. Wow, it's amazing. So I don't know what they did, but it's working. But you know, again, the Ruag is four hours a piece, and the RCC is ten. Yeah, but. At that level, if, it, if it, I mean, how much do people spend to get a hundred feet per second more? Right? They spend a lot more. Well, than it's that. not so much that you know. It's it's the sticky bolt thing that really messes you well, up. You're trying to keep a nice position, reliability. and you got to be cranking on the bolt, and you're all out of position, and you got to shoot fast. So, you know, just like you know, when you get a calm condition, and you rapid fire that you know as fast as you can go. Well, if you got to be pounding on the bolt, you're all out of position. Your oh, yeah. rifle's oh, canting. Yeah. It's a and nightmare. You're frustrated. So and you're frustrated. Even if we even if we had the same velocity, which I'm going to load these down to get the best accuracy. Accuracy always wins over speed. So I'll load it to the best of its ability for accuracy. And I think the 238 probably will work just fine for us. But then now we don't have any sticky bolts. So just that alone will be worth a lot for us. Well, that's the reason I tell people not to next size, right? Because that's literally the problems that you develop when people next size they're they're banging yeah. their bolt and it's just it's just not reliable yeah i don't i'm not too fancy here at this house i'm pretty much old school i just load, load and shoot a lot of virgin brass i do a lot of inspections and measuring and weighing but i don't have a you know a blake uh lathe and you know i'm not doing all the stuff now now when I'm retired, maybe I'll have more time to come see you and maybe learn how to do that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> come, come by, man. Well, well, you know, I got a thousand yards. I can probably stretch to twelve hundred, so we can probably do a little bit of 
shooting with your big boomer. Where are you at, out of? Uh, San Antonio, so, Texas. Okay, well, so we're not that far from my friend. Uh, he's in uh, um, near now near San Antonio as well. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, David Park lives about a 45 minutes to an hour from yeah. me. So he's, he's and he's doing well in, in ELR, too. There's a lot of people that are, that are you know, I watch, like, from, from the sidelines, right? And, and uh, you know, as you were saying, social media really helps a lot because yeah. you know how it used to be. You would only know FTR or F-class results if you were an F class shooter and you were following that, right? Sure. Same thing with Palma, same thing with, but now with social media, yeah. I follow a lot of, a lot of, you know, I follow you. I follow a lot of these other guys sure. and I see the results, right? Like, Oh, right. Okay. And, and I look at the results and I see, you know, I see you and I see, uh, you know, of course, lit and, and all the usual mm -hmm. suspects, but then I see David Park and then I yeah. found out Dave, that's how I found out David Mann's been, no wonder we yeah. haven't seen him at the, F class shoots. He's, he's over there yeah. shooting, uh, shooting that now. Uh, ELR and I see, uh, you know, yeah. Robert from Alamo Precision. He's he's over there, right. and and all of a sudden I see all these people and I kind of, you know, f see well, what they're Speedy, doing. Speedy was, yeah, Speedy. To, I've seen up. Speedy over there too. And Shiraz talked to me about possibly getting involved a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know what's funny? I'll, I'll tell you about social media. So, I've been going to shot quite a few years and. You know, helping you know influence and whatnot, and and uh, we were around a bunch of people, and it was me and Derek Rogers, and I think Kelly McMillan was there. And we were all just you know talking, and uh, some people come up and they wanted to see me and my gun, and they didn't know Kelly, they didn't know Derek, and it's just funny. It's like I couldn't believe you know because because of social media, here you have a world champion, you know Derek yeah, Rogers, right. the reigning world champion for FTR. They don't even know who he is. And I'm thinking to myself, that's crazy, you know. Derek doesn't do a lot of social media. So right. unless you're maybe you're just an F class shooter, you'd know who he is, but there you know, unless you're involved in social media, you wouldn't even have a clue. You know? Well, yeah, and that's the thing, right? It's 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 the whole if a if a bear in the woods type of thing, right? It's right. Just, if if you're the absolute best shooter in the world, but nobody knows who you are. Sure. It's it's hard, right? So social media is obviously that's why I'm doing this, I'm, and I want to yeah. I want to bring light to all you guys that sure. that you know that you know like people know who you know Paul Phillips, yeah. King of Two Mile, this that and the other, but they don't know the Paul Phillips I know, and there's a lot that I don't know. You yeah. know what I mean? And this is why I started doing this because yeah. there's there's uh, there's just so much that people don't understand that like you go through to get to, to where you're at and sure. somebody else may have a different path. You know, I, I interviewed uh, Gary Costello, which is, the, he was the yeah. 2009 uh, world champion F open sure. and to hear his story. I mean, all I know is like, Oh, world champion, but to hear his story, how he got there and what happened, you know, what that win did to him and what happened afterwards, you know, it's just, it's incredible. It's yeah. things that we don't really know or we don't see, but it's, it's, it's the competitor, uh, life, you know, that, that right. everybody thinks, oh, world champion, but you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot to get there. Well, you know? Gary is going to come, he's getting the ELR team together too. Oh, I imagine. Uh, yeah. You know, him and, uh, um, Stuart. The FTR shooter, uh -huh. and uh, I'm not sure about Russell Simmons, but I know those guys are getting a team together. And then, you know, Gianfranco Zanoni. Yeah, uh -huh. he's he's so in he, Italy, right? Italy. Yeah. So I flew out to France, and they had me coach them in France in 2019. And me and Gianfranco, it was Italian USA team, and um, we took uh, second, third, and sixth. Wow. Our first time, so yeah. I mean, there's a lot of F open and F class shooters that are that are dabbling with it. Well, you um, know, it's like you were saying, right? It's it's pretty much the same skill set. You just extending it a little further. So yeah, and then and then it you know you really, I would say that you could have a really good shooting rifle and practice with FTR or F open. You don't really have to know how to use a Kestrel. You don't really have to know how to use a ballistic solver. You don't really have to really know even how to read the wind that i mean anybody can go up there and if it's on their right side aim a little bit to the right 
like my daughter. My daughter, you know, we took her shooting 22s, and she was sitting up to three, 400, and 500 yards of the 22 rim fire. Mm-hmm. After about 10, 15 minutes, because I always told her, tell me what you see, tell me what you feel, and what you what you think you should do. After 10, 15 minutes, Eric, okay, the rim's coming from my right. I got to aim a little bit to the right. And then she started bracketing it like I talked to you about. Pretty soon she was nailing 300, 400 yard plates with a 22 rim fire. Right. And then she ended up hitting 1,000. But I'm just saying, that's different than, you know, you, anybody can go to a match and you know it's a thousand yards. You don't have to worry about range finding. Right. And you kind of have an idea what way the wind's blowing. You might, yeah, maybe you shoot a seven or eight, but then you can kind of walk it over and then, you know, string fire, you know, and then just put them right in there, you know, and versus maybe doing purifier where you actually have to maybe more make more calculations on what the wind's doing. Right. right. So I think maybe a purifying is, I think, more of a raw talent, I think. You know, I believe so, because um, now, as you know, you can't really use your previous shot to or you can't game it either because he can be aiming it off. <laughs> exactly. So you have. Right. No <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's that's a, a more pure form of the sport when you pair fire. So um, 38 to 40 inch barrels. Uh, you say you're using cutting edge bullets. Is that what you said? Yep, we're using the. 550 green cutting edge bullets, and we're using uh, RCC brass. And I'm, obviously, I'm a Vitaberry sponsored shooter. It just it turns out that you know the 20 and 29 Vitaberry powder was just like the best powder. It works great, and it's almost full. It's like 95 percent case capacity, and it, it's unbelievable. Standard deviations like one two. Doing the RWS primers. And that's how the bench press 50 cal guys use those at the world championships. I use those and they work good. And, um, and then, you know, big any triggers and, um, night force scopes and, uh, Holland levels, Terminator five brakes, Bartland barrels, bad actions, and now the manor stock. And, uh, you know, for the, the exhibition shooting, we haven't talked about that, but you know, we did 3.4 miles in 19, 18 we did four miles and 19 now we're gonna be going for five miles but we're just having fun with that eric that's just an exhibition shot we're not claiming any world records it's just going out and having fun and seeing how far we can launch a bullet and hit something did and you what, say hang on i'm sorry to interrupt you did you say three yeah. miles or three thousand yards 3.4 miles 3.4 miles so, six thousand twelve yards so you you said five oh. miles right we're going to be going for five miles this year. I'm yes, sorry. I, I just, it's hard to process. I'm like five miles or 5,000 yards. It's, it's, you guys yeah, are five miles is five miles is 8,800 yards. That's what I'm saying. You guys are, cause you, you guys, you already connected over 7,000, correct? Four miles. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's not, you know, there's kind of some, I think maybe misinformation and I was going to do a documentary and I'm working on that. When I retire, I'm going to be working on that because we have all the footage from the 3.4 and the four mile impacts, but I want to do it right. I don't want to just do a, you know, a cheaply done uh, YouTube video. I want to do a professional video to explain everything. Our, you know, the world record events three for three uh, with ELR. That's a world record event that we had. I put the first one on in Las Vegas and, uh, Let's see, Nate Stalter and David Tubbs set it at like 17 or 1,800 yards, something like that. And I did one at – there was only three of us that went three for three. It was me, John Armstrong, and Nate Stalter. We were 1,500 yards and like 17, 1,800 yards. Well, now it's up to like 2,400 yards, I think. That's three for three. That's actually an event. And then there's ELR matches, King of Two Mile, Nash, NRA National Championships, Spear Point, uh, other ones. Those are like matches that you go and you format. Well, then there's kind of like this exhibition, I call it exhibition, because you're just going out and having fun, but you are trying to hit a target. Now, when we did the four mile shot, there was on video, we had professional video for everything. On video, we're shooting three shot volleys. Shoot three times really fast. Boom, boom, boom. You wait 23 seconds, and then three bullets hit within 10 feet of the target. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, come up, half a minute, send it. Boom, boom, boom. Wait 23 seconds. Over top the target. Boom, boom, boom. 10, 15 foot. So it's not like you're just, you keep shooting and hopefully you hit it. We're actually doing educated guesses based upon our three shot groups at four miles. So it's interesting. You know what? 
when I got to the Marine Corps in 92, I was fascinated with extreme long range even before there was DLR. And that was what was just the story I told you with the 300 wind mag with me and John Drolly. We're just going to see if we can hit a mile, you know. Didn't do very well, but it was fun. And then now the progression of the ELR rifles and then, you know, the TACOM HQ prism and sights. I think you did a segment with Chase about that. I've been, you know, testing the product and working with him on that. But he's making me a new one that will have enough elevation. It'll be 2,500 minutes of elevation. So we'll have enough elevation to take it as far as we can possibly go. And I think with the 416 Barrett, Brian and Nick Botaldo did did the mock-up for me, and I think it was like um, 9,000 meters. So what is that? It's almost six miles? Far. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Far. <laughs> yeah. So at five miles, Eric, we're going to be pretty much at the end of the game for conventional. We might have to go to like a 20 millimeter or something. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> So what's next? I mean, you guys are using lathe turn bullets. So uh, at some point, yeah, we're using the uh, monolithic cutting edge, and we're using the turn brass, turn bullets, the ivory powder, and the RWS primers. You know, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot what's, of wildcat. What's, what's Brian Litz working on? He's got. A, I mean, I, I feel like he's what? He's, he's working with a neighbor. The reason people don't understand that. The reason he came up with enabler was for the military ESO project, mm -hmm. but the enabler round is shorter than the 375 Shytac for magazine fed rifles mm -hmm. for the military rifles. You know, the Cadex and Barrett style chassis with the magazine feed, the enabler round was shortened up so they can get them in the magazine. But if you want to go pure raw power and, and precision, you go with a longer action with a bigger bullet, bolt action, more like your F open gun or your FTR gun, it's a precision bench press rifle in the field right. shooting one to two miles. It's hard to beat the 416. There's people that are shooting the 460 Steyr now. That shoots a little bit bigger bullet, a little faster. Um, there's still 50 cal guys out there, but it's a race. It's a horse race to find the best, almost like F open, right? The best balance. You got your yeah. magnums and you got your six fives and you got your seven millimeters and everybody thinks they're the best. And whoever wins the nationals, whatever he's using, everybody goes to that. Yeah. Ridge, right? Yeah. So, so you guys are still kind of chasing the best caliber, the best balance, uh, but not it's, really. It's I mean, hard. Our, our team. Well, I was going to say it's probably hard. Well, it's hard in, on your game because you guys keep extending the ranges. So whatever you know, because there's a different. There's something that works probably best, you know, like a one mile, right? If there was one mile, you probably. Wouldn't well, be it's funny, you know. So in nineteen, I had. We had the light class and the heavy class at the nationals and our targets only went up to 2100 yards so it was a short match speaking about elr so their light class was a 338 caliber under 26 pounds um that was restricted to 338 under and 25 pounds 26 pounds the heavy class is up to 50 up to 50 cal wow. well ray gross shooting my rifle my ammo beat everybody with a 33 xc with a 275, so I'm just saying, <clears throat> out to 2,100 yards that day, Ray beat everybody with a, 30, a 338. So, again, though, Eric, if it's blowing 30 mile an hour, yeah, you know, maybe the 416 would kind of overcome that you know, wind drift and be better. But um, I think, but going one more step further, the King of Two Mile has been won with a uh, 416 Barrett three times a 375 two times yeah so yeah so that 375 and 416 have won everything at king of two mile yeah. there's never been a yeah. 338 that's won so it all depends on the course of fire and how far you're shooting and the wind and elements so 416 is your your uh what you guys have settled on in my opinion in my opinion i think it's the best cartridge right now for elr yes Good, good. Um, I was so yeah. So Robert Brantley won in the four sixteen and eighteen. I won in nineteen. And we, our team finished first, third, and fourth. Actually, the first, second, third, fourth, and I think fifth. Maybe not, but top four or five positions were all four sixteen. So that kind of says something, right? Yeah, for sure. So tell me about your company, Global Precision Group. What what do you guys do? Is that just you, or you have a group of guys? 
Um, well, it's just me right now until I retire. And then I might, I'll expand depending on what kind of contracts, but I'm working with, um, uh, until I retire, I'll kind of keep it kind of hush just for sense of information. But yeah. I'm working with companies right now as a consultant doing load and load development, testing, product testing, uh, that sort of thing right now. But then when I retire, I'll probably maybe expand it into doing maybe sales, training, um, consult. I'm teaching a uh, clinic. Um, and actually, I'm going to invite you to that. It's going to be the gathering for all the Marine Corps and Army snipers. Um, a lot of VIPs, uh, procurement people. Um, a good friend of mine was the president of the Marine Corps Scout Sniper Association, uh, Tim Parkers, and he invited me down. And there's going to be a lot of known people there. Vallejo's coming. Um, a lot of different, uh, you know, big names to do clinics and PRS. I'm going to do an ELR clinic. And to show all the latest and greatest components and equipment, kind of show those guys what we do. You know, I'm not there to tell them how to do anything because it's a, you know, I wasn't a scout sniper platoon back in the day in the Marine Corps as well. And um, I was in the first Gulf War. So I know the mentality. I'm not there to tell them anything because it's a different game. But just to maybe bring some light to what we're doing, how we're doing it, what we're using, and how it may be applicable to them someday. Maybe, maybe so, maybe not. But, you know, they are looking at, getting bigger weapons now you know there's things in development with the military and procurement where they're going to be looking at these bigger profile rifles for certain places and certain things that they do so it's definitely going to come back uh everything we're doing now is going to come back to help the military i think you know yeah. to provide for them yeah. and show them there might be certain applications where they could use these highly precision long extreme long range rifles right right well, very, very interesting stuff, man. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this for us. I mean, I, I, I'm, as I told you, I'm fascinated with, with some of the stuff you guys are doing because it's it's never yeah. been done before. You know what I mean? It's Well, we're definitely going to get together, Eric. I want to do some trade with you. We can go shooting. And there's an ELR range in Texas. Like a good friend of mine owns it, and we can go shoot some ELR, show you what I'm talking about, real practical stuff in the field try your hand and then uh, maybe shoot some pigs and then maybe we can take a trip to your place and you can educate me on this, you know, cause I, you know, the F open guys, you know, they definitely, you know, they're the leaders. I think, you know, that's kind of like the, you, you guys do a lot of load development and you're, I think you're closer to bench rest than the FTR guys, you know, we just, put it on a bipod and let her go <laughs> yeah well i mean uh yeah i mean we we obviously especially the the way the game is nowadays if if you don't have a really i mean you can be a really good shooter but if you don't have a really good shooting rifle it's going to be hard to win you know what i mean and and access we need to shoot a lot of access but yeah man come on over we'll we'll we'll, we'll uh, exchange notes <laughs> yeah man no i i appreciate what you're doing it's a lot of fun i enjoy watching your videos and it's informative and I'm not sure if I'll do what you're doing, but I'd like to do something maybe in the field with people and maybe going over basic stuff. I mean, a lot of times people talk about stuff, but watching a video, they can kind of see what, how to do it and what you're doing. You know, when you read it in a book or you, you see literature or something, sometimes it doesn't make sense, but if you watch it, sometimes it's a little easier. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's people learn different ways, right? Um, uh, and uh but anyway uh well oh, hey one more thing yeah i got a plug yeah. here so i just did a, a article in ballistic precision man. oh man that's awesome yeah it's on the shelves now and let's see uh my good friend sean utley called me up and said hey man you want to do an article i said sure uh what do you what do you got in mind so he says i'll just pick something out and do it so uh we just i actually got the centerfold it's my article i did wow it's on spotting see that yeah i see that but yeah so i did it on spotting and you know all the things i've learned over the years uh as far as for elr but it's kind of a cool article and uh it goes over all the fundamentals and uh talks about different different types of devices so yeah. if you're wanting to learn a little about spotting go check out that article yeah spotting that's one thing that is everybody wants to shoot right but spotting is so important, as you know. Well, you may not know this, but um, you know I'm on the U.S. rifle team. But I'm now I am I'm I'm a coach now. You know I started right. as a shooter, and now I'm a 
Now I'm a coach. Right. I went coach, and uh, right. uh, spotting is so critical. I mean, it's finding those. Most everybody just wants to look down range and find a flag, but it's it's that's what everybody looks at. The the, the really good guys, and I'm not saying I'm a good guy, but I'm just saying we find the minor little details, the the the, the little thing that's gonna tell you the stuff that you need to know before. It, right. You get blown out of the center, right? Sure. But spotting sure. is so... That's the latest thing that I've been focusing on or yeah. trying to read up on and learn uh, because it's, sure. it's so important. It is so well, important. Well, one of the things one of the things that Ray Gross and I talked about um, was in 17 was we wanted our coaches to go over to Canada and shoot as many matches as possible to look at the conditions to learn the range. Every range is very unique. And if you can pick out those things, you know, your home range, you shoot, you know, every little crook and cranny of that thing. You look down, oh, yeah, that's five minutes, you know. But really, you go to someone else's territory, their range, you really got to learn their nuances of that range. And so we sent our coaches there, you know, the America matches and, you know, regional matches and, you know, oddball matches. And, you know, we picked up a lot of information, just like you're talking about. So to be successful, you really need to practice where you're going to have the you know, as much as possible at the range you're going to be competing at, whether it be nationals or world championship or, you know, king of two mile, whatever. But so for us, you know, especially with environmentals for us, you know, we need to practice in Raton, you know, with the same elevation, same temperature, same station pressure, same, same ballistics, um, same type of environment, right? So you have rocky and different terrain and stuff to start to learn what it looks like when you see a splash or learn where to look for trades or, Know, all those nuances and make notes and so then you really are mastering your environment is what you're doing right right yeah. yeah very interesting so all right just to wrap it up i every time i do an interview i ask whoever i interview to nominate somebody that, I, that they think i should talk to that that you think people need to hear from you know what i mean someone that you say you know what you need to talk to this person because right. i think Again, I understand that I only know what I know, right? But you may know somebody that yeah. kind of like the six degrees of separation type of thing, right? Who do you think I should contact and reach yeah. out to to interview? What what area? Uh, Hunting, that's military. My point. It doesn't matter. Shooting related, obviously, yeah. but some you know our viewers or my viewers, right? Our viewers. Um, I'm I'm trying to put together this this ongoing show i don't want to call it a show but i don't have a better word for it but but people i want to i want to highlight put a spotlight on people like you right uh, like i said i did uh gary costello you and i know exactly yeah. who gary costello is but a lot of people don't know who he is right but all yeah. that his ex i mean the guy world champion right yeah. what i want to hear from him and people are going to pick up something from him right and so it really almost doesn't matter. I, I, I want to meet interesting people, people that, that have possibly influenced you in some way that, you know, they're, yeah. whatever they have to say may help somebody else down the road. Right. Um, well, you know, I, I would give you a lot of, you know, bullet makers, barrel makers, stock makers. But, you know, I think it would be interesting I think it'd be nice to make a parallel between what we do for a living in competitive shooting and to take a step where how we could utilize everything that we know in the real world condition of maybe hunting or military. I know a good friend of mine is James DeVoglier. He lives in Texas mm -hmm. and he owns um, KBR Ranch. Mm -hmm. And he has these high profile clients that come in and they want to learn all the fundamentals of this long range shooting for hunts in Africa. Mm -hmm. Like high dollar hunts where they cannot miss. If they wound the animal, they still pay fifty grand. Yeah, it gets yeah. away. These are like major high profile clients that are starving for knowledge from you and me to provide for you know hunting and these high profile hunting um, expeditions they go on, and it's just fascinating from his perspective of how he's using information of what we're doing for well, his business. Would, uh, that would be exactly what I want to hear. You know, I, I want to talk yeah. to somebody like that. So if, uh, you know, once we get off, uh, shoot me an email, maybe get me in sure. touch with him. And uh, I'd like to talk and he's to He's also him. the guy that actually was my 
client that pulled the trigger on the formal impact. Wow. Wow. That's so awesome. kind of, and he's on my team GPG this year for King of two miles. So, but as far as the hunting aspect of how they can utilize all this stuff for real world hunts and why it's so important, I think that'd be a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Well, there you go. So for example, Gary Costello, he, uh, he, uh, he said, I should talk to Dan Warner because he says, you right. know, I want, I want to hear the, the gunsmith aspect of it. You know, right. Dan Warner's been a coach and, and I said, well, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Dan, Dan built me my first, or Alan, oh, Alan cool. Warner, Alan Warner. Yeah, Alan Warner and Dan Warner. They built my first um, Palmer rifle in '93. Well, there you go. So I'm I'm gonna talk to them, but yeah, get me in touch with your buddy, man. I think that's uh, that would be and interesting. And then maybe we can go down to his place and get to do a pig hunt. There you go. We'll do that. <laughs> I'm not paying fifty grand for a pig, though. <laughs> No, just just some pointers on reloading, maybe. There you go. We'll do that. All right, Paul. I appreciate this. Thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll do another one some other day. Roger that. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.